Hello everyone. While we're all socially distanced and under lockdown, there are a lot of people telling us that being away from others is a chance to recharge, reevaluate, take stock of what we have, and feel grateful. But some of you, maybe quite a few of you, might not be feeling that way. Spending more time alone, or even worse, living in the shadows of people who might be reminding us about our own weaknesses can be intense and difficult. If you already feel different, this exceptional circumstance we're in might make you feel even more different. But that's okay. Different people can and do change the world for the better. In 2007, founder and chairman of Apple, Steve Jobs, said the following. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. They have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify and vilify them. About the one thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may seem to be crazy, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. A few years later, this inspired me to produce a piece of writing called Round Pegs, which I'm going to read to you today. I hope it strikes a chord with you, or at the very least, I hope it gets you to see others in a slightly different light. Round Pegs. There is a boy called Michael. Michael is willowy, pale. He walks with long, low strides, arms straight down by his sides, as stiff as rods of iron thrust down his coat sleeves. His fingers are working always jerking, with thumb pressed against alternate finger pads. His head is filled with integers and fractions that converge, divide, multiply every sweet and sentient object that he takes in. Michael's pupils swim like tadpoles behind thick lenses. He looks through you with that strange blank page of the face, an ambivalent guest from a planet far away. For whole weekends, to the edge of the town's satellite estate, Michael purchases perches on the modest hump of a lonely island roundabout. He arrives with the unheard dawn chorus, placing his packed lunch on a faded Britain in Bloom sign. Michael sits and he sits and he sits, always bolt upright, always as still as can be. Cars wheel round, long streams of colour and sound, a kaleidoscopic cacophony of horns and gear changes and whining brakes and scratching exhaust pipes. Hey, freaky weirdo, what are you doing? But Michael sees the number plates, every one that comes past. Vehicles pass, all colours, all makes, all marks. Mark three Peach Ford Cortina GLX, blink, capture. Vauxhall Viva 8C, red, blink, capture. Austin Allegro 1973 P Green, blink, capture. Connections, patterns, everywhere. Hey, tell Michael the colour and make of your dad's car. Go on, bet you he can tell you the number plate. NAT233A. Or, no, tell Michael your dad's number plate. He'll say it back, quick as you like. Capri Mercury, 2600, three door, blue. Tell Michael your birthday. He'll tell you what day you were born on. 3rd of December, 1968, Tuesday. Freaky or what? Ask Michael if he wants to come to your party. Are you coming along, Michael? Blank look. Just kidding. Then there's another boy called Nigel. One day, outside the skates before school, Nigel's mum asks your mum if you might want to Nigel to come round after school. Or do you want to come round to Nigel's? He hasn't really made that many friends, you see. And your lad seems, well, quite a nice boy, quiet. The sort of boy that Nigel might, well, get on with. So you go to Nigel's for tea. Your mum says, take your new set of racing cars, the Formula One ones that you bought with your holiday money. You'll like those. Because your mum really wants you to get on with Nigel, for Nigel's mum's sake. Nigel's mum's really worried about him. So you get to go to Nigel's house and Nigel's mum calls for him. But Nigel won't come. So Nigel's mum takes you by the hand and leads you upstairs to Nigel's room. But it's not like your room. It's a very special room. There are millions of colourful little drawings spilling over the walls. Delicate flowers. Girls in dresses and houses with little picket fences. 
queens in castles, chiffon throws in pastel colours, shimmering above the bed across the curtain rails. And there are doll's houses and little shoe boxes, all labelled and adorned with shining stones and glitter, all arranged in neat rows around the skirting boards, with doll's clothes neatly pressed and immaculately folded inside each. There aren't toys like your toys. There are girls' toys. Dresses and hairbrushes, bears in bonnets and tiny shopping baskets, mermaids and ballet dancers spinning and diving from the ceiling on lengths of coloured string. A private universe that no one will ever see, because to open the door to the real world would be to, would be to invite jeers and ridicule. Nigel. Gay boy Nigel. So there is Nigel sitting on a tartan picnic blanket, pale legs tucked underneath. He's having a tea party with some of his dolls and he's got his mum's shoes on. Nigel's mum is watching your face, carefully, anxiously. Oh, Nigel, she says suddenly, I thought I told you to tidy your dolls away under the bed. Where's that nice Kevin Keegan football game that I told you to get out? The one Uncle Keith got you for last Christmas. Look, Nigel, he's bought some lovely new racing cars. But Nigel isn't interested in your cars. He moves them to one side and they disappear under his bed. He pats the space on the floor beside himself and you sit down. He pours three pretend cups of tea. One for Sarah Louise, his favourite doll. The other one for you and one for himself. Fascinated, you watch his delicate fingers Nails painted sea green pinch the tiny handles of the china teacups before raising them to the pursed lips of his doll. He passes the other little china cup to you and you take tiny sips too. Nigel's mum stands for a while, clasping and unclasping her hands before finally sip, stepping out of the room, satisfied. An hour passes like a minute, a life inside the delightful ulterior universe of Nigel's imagination. Underwater tea parties, dressing up games, shops, Shetland pony gymkhanas and proper manners. A safe place of sleepy charm and gentle lullabies. A world away from racing cars, Batman, top trumps. A distant doorbell. It's your mum. Time to go. Then, they've both had such a lovely time. I do hope he can come back again soon. A sad pang. For what for? Once back outside and into the real world of action men, Liverpool FC and Grey's Knees, you know you will never let any of your friends know that you have spent time in Nigel's house. And you know that you will never return to collect your racing cars. The next week, Nigel is playing kitchens with some of the girls next to the oil tank in the school playground. You keep your eyes trained to the ground as you walk past with your regular friends for fear of his trying to say hello, and for deeper fears of having to read the disappointment in his face, and he the shame in yours. For you're too young to know that Nigel, and for Michael, the die has been cast. At some point before they'd ever been born, ever conceived, their wiring has been pre-planned, recast, to create something different, something that will help shape the world and the experience of being human into a better, more wonderful thing. Here and now, you're too young to know about prejudice or resilience or defeat, or to know that sometimes you get sad purely because you are different too, as indeed does everyone. But your time will come, and in years to come, the world will become more beholden to the round pegs in square holes. Thanks everyone. See you soon.